Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're going to be talking about condiments. Getting a little saucy. <laughs> Sorry, that was horrible. See, I, I apologize. Was a, I was going to make a much worse joke. Condiments are not, you know, something left on your pillow in your condo. But Oh, that's really bad. It's not even <laughs> dirty or funny or anything. <laughs> right. Uh, so maybe I would say that we're trying to get all the pens out of our system early, but I bet that's not true. I bet we'll find some more. But anyway, yes, we're going to talk about condiments. Uh, this is just something that's kind of occurred to us recently. A uh, bunch of words and historical details that we thought were interesting. So just really a word-focused episode, I think, today. And history. And history. And food. Because you may have gathered we're kind of into food. <laughs> we don't have any major follow-up or business to do before we get started, other than I wanted to mention that I was very pleased that after our last episode on Gimlet and gin, at least two people contacted me to say <laughs> that they had been inspired to go out and buy some gin or try some gin again after having not liked it before. I'm so glad to lead you down an evil primrose path. <laughs> Excellent. So well done, everyone. And that brings us to cocktails for tonight. So with tonight, we're having Caesars, bloody Caesars. Indeed. Which is, if you're not from Canada, a bit like a Bloody Mary, mm -hmm. except instead of using tomato juice, mm -hmm. You make it with tomato juice with clam juice added, or more likely, you make it with Clamato. Which is a particular brand, which is tomato juice with clam juice added. Mm -hmm. Or other things calling themselves Caesar Mix. There's now various other yeah. fancy or other brands that call themselves Caesar Mix. But to me, it's a bloody Caesar is Clamato. Yeah. It's a particular brand with vodka. And, and we'd be interested to hear if, if you are indeed from outside of Canada, if you've ever heard of this cocktail before and if it has made its way into the Rest global the world. cocktail yeah. world. Like a Bloody Mary, it also is usually served with various condiments. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason we chose it. The seafood connection will become evident, I think, why that's relevant. It's also a Bloody Caesar, which of course is Roman. And I'm going to be talking a fair amount about some Roman condiments. And I've garnished it today with some bitters, the, the Scrappy's Firewater Bitters, which are essentially like Tabasco sauce without the vinegar. Mm -hmm. And Worcester sauce, which is a key component, like for a Bloody Mary, it's a key component of a Caesar. And then instead of, instead of the traditional celery, I've used one of our homemade pickled asparagus spears. This is partly because I just think they're yummy and will be less crunchy for you listening. <laughs> but also as a nod to another little Roman bit, because not that asparagus are specifically Roman, but I always think of them as being Roman because they were eaten, certainly by Romans, and they liked them. And Augustus, Emperor Augustus, one of his favorite sayings was, do something as quick as boiled asparagus. It was just one of his homely sayings that he would use. So I always think of asparagus as being Roman. And, and there's your Caesar connection. Right. Okay, good. <laughs> so cheers. Cheers. Oh, I do like a Caesar. Clamato is really good. I know that if you haven't heard of it before, you're sitting there right now thinking, tomato and clam juice? Are you people out of your minds? That can't possibly be good. All I can say to you is it's delicious. Well, and apparently the, the drink's creator invented the drink out of inspiration of Italian cuisine mixing clams and tomato. Right, of course. That's a, yeah, that's a classic. And tomato and pasta. Mm -hmm. That's a classic dish. It's that's true. a classic dish. And so he basically turned it into a cocktail. Oh, well, that makes it sound very classy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and the other reason we're having it is I had suggested it because we got a bottle of Clamato for its uh, the May 2-4 weekend here. Victoria Day weekend, which is another holiday that nobody outside of Canada knows about. And I'd be hard put to explain why we even have a holiday celebrating Queen Victoria, but we do. Uh, and it's the traditional beginning of summer in Canada. It's the weekend everybody opens their cottages and goes to the beach for the first time, even though it's rarely warm enough. And it's also the last frost date. So gardeners start their gardening in a lot of Canada, not everywhere. So it's sort of the traditional beginning of summer. So I suggested we could make this drink today since we had it. And then I happened to see a tweet 
a sponsored tweet, I'm sorry to say that I actually saw one, saying that today is National Caesar Day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone except Mots Clamato believes that today is National Caesar Day. But anyway, uh, that be being the Thursday before the May 2-4 weekend, which is, they, as they say, the traditional beginning of the summer. That just seemed to clinch it. It's yes. National Caesar Day. I guess we have to have a Caesar. Indeed. And we will be coming back to uh, Worcestershire sauce. Blech. <laughs> and we will be coming back to Worcestershire sauce. Uh, Worcestershire sauce. If you just, no, you pronounce the sure. If you just cut everything else out, though, it's so much easier to pronounce. If you just start with the first syllable and the last syllable and just cut the stuff in between. <laughs> <laughs> That's my approach. Uh, so, we, yes, we can talk about Worcestershire sauce. <laughs> yeah, that'll be actually relevant. Particularly relevant. Yes. So oh, good. All right. Well, then, without further ado, let us turn to the subject of condiments. And it really was a slightly random topic. Somebody suggested it to Someone us. Someone suggested ketchup. Right. Yeah, it was It was at least via Sam. He maybe passed. Somebody else asked about ketchup. Yeah, Sam McLean, I think, that's uh, right. asked about it or passed on the idea that we should talk mm -hmm. about ketchup. That's right. That's why we put it on our list. So thank you, Sam. And that kind of led us to thinking more broadly about condiments and sauces because they are actually interesting. There's interesting stories to do with some of the names. And also sauces end up being quite emblematic of the cultures that produce them. Or at least some sauces are. And so we thought that could give us a topic to talk about. Indeed. And I think we're going to have a sort of couple of running themes that go through this discussion of sauces and condiments and so forth about stored foods, mm -hmm. processed foods, and globalized foods. Right. So do you want to just start off with the word sauce? Well, we should start off with the word condiment. Right. Okay. Perhaps. Which essentially means stored, preserved. Right. Literally, it means put together, mm -hmm. so con, cum, mm -hmm. and an Indo-European root that gives us a whole bunch of words. It's a highly productive root mm -hmm. uh, that means to put. Okay. So it's from the idea of sort of putting away, I guess, is, is the idea, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's preserved pickled food. And it comes from Latin. Presumably. comes from Latin, yeah. yeah, via French, of course. So condiments are essentially preserves they're, mm -hmm. they're preserved sauces Foods, right. that preserved foodstuffs. The sort of related concept to condiments is, of course, seasoning, mm. because condiments and, and seasoning are both used for flavoring foods. Mm -hmm. Seasoning linguistically means it's related to seasons, the time mm -hmm. of year, from the notion of ripened fruit. So if you allow fruit to ripen, it becomes better. Right. So if you add a seasoning, it improves the, the Possibly food. subpar food or think, brings things up to its, its yeah. sort of perfection or, exactly. or better quality. Okay. Now, what's the difference between seasonings and condiments? In, say, modern use? In, in say, modern use, one might ask. Yeah. And so we can turn to Auguste Escoffier, who right. is the codifier of western cuisine i guess you could french cuisine french, french cuisine, style cuisine european yeah. cuisine he's he's the guy who codified the idea of the five mother sauces right right and according to wikipedia he also specifically codified the difference between seasonings and condiments mm -hmm. um, and he comes up with sort of these categories so you have saline seasonings salt based seasonings mm -hmm. acid seasonings so vinegar based mm -hmm. seasonings or lemon juice yeah or lemon juice mm -hmm. hot seasonings so things like peppercorns mm -hmm. or other hot spices and saccharin seasonings so sugar honey right and then condiments include the pungents so onions shallots garlics chives that mm -hmm. sort of thing horseradish Hot condiments, so mustard, mm -hmm. most importantly, and what we would consider various types of pickled things, gherkins, capers. Those count as hot? Hot, yeah. Mm, interesting. Including Worcestershire sauce. Okay. And other similar type sauces. And then fatty substances, so butter, oils, and so forth. Okay. I don't think of the fatty ones anyway as being condiments, at least in my, mm -hmm. but then, you know, who am I to quibble with, uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> to quibble with Escoffier? Okay. But obviously, you know, the idea of salt plays into kind of, in a sense, both of these categories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, salt is a seasoning in itself, mm -hmm. just on its own. And certainly in modern cooking, when they say season. Season. They usually mean add salt They mean salt add and salt and pepper. Yeah. But in terms of those various types of pickled mm -hmm. condiments, obviously salt plays an important role in the production of those products. Mm. 
as I was saying before we started, for me, not having heard that definition before, I would have said that I couldn't think of a single condiment that I would call a condiment that didn't have salt in it. Right. When I think of condiments now, I think of them as being highly flavored, sort of concentrated flavored things that you add to food at the table, pretty much at the end that it's you don't cook with it it gets added at the end that's to me what a condiment is so right. that's ketchup i mean you might use it in cooking as well but the reason it's a condiment is it's because it's something you might add at the end so mustard ketchup relish are the really basic ones but uh, a mm -hmm. bunch of other Worcester sauce or hp sauce or all sorts of other things like that kimchi i mean all of those things are things you'd add at the end mm -hmm. And every single one of them has salt, and most of them are highly salted. Right. And, and then uh, all sorts of uh, chutneys and curried pickles and things like that would all count as condiments to me. And all of those are, because everything mm -hmm. that's pickled, almost everything that's pickled has uh, salt in it as well. So, of course, you know, as we said, salt has this important role in mm -hmm. preserving in probably cultures around the world independently. Mm -hmm. uh, you figure know, that one figure out. Figure that yeah. one out. That salt could be used to preserve foods. And so this goes way back mm -hmm. in terms of human history. It's mm -hmm. also, though, when you think about it, one of the first sort sorts of processed foods, because the method of yeah. getting salt, you have to either mine it mm -hmm. or evaporate water from right. you know, seawater to, to get the salt out. Mm -hmm. um, so it's one of the first processed foods even if it's a fairly basic processing yeah even yeah, if it's salt pans basic. and things like that yeah. are, are early early mm -hmm. forms of processing and so salt becomes necessary as soon as you get agriculture right when you're a hunter-gatherer you get your basic salt requirements i mean it's it's a it's an important nutrient that the body needs but it's in if you're eating a lot of meat if you're eating a lot of meat get you're it. getting enough salt mm -hmm. but as soon as a large part of your basic diet is taken up with grains, you need to supplement that with salt. Mm -hmm. And so it also is the sort of foundation of processed food. Right. Sauce, the word sauce, mm -hmm. is related to salt. It I comes... was just going to bring that up yeah. if you didn't. Yes. <laughs> I was waiting for you to because I figured you would. So they all they all come from this, this same, you know, Latin root. I mean, the word salt, in fact, comes through the English, through the Germanic line, but it comes from the same Proto-Indo-European root. Mm -hmm. um, so in Latin, it's sal, salis. Sal, salis, from which salsa or salsum, mm -hmm. salsus, Meaning the, the adjective salted. salted mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, which also gives us, of course, the word salsa, mm -hmm. which is a kind of sauce. Mm -hmm. Think about it, it's not very surprising. Uh, but it also gives us the word sauce, importantly. Sausage. Right. Which is salted meat. Yep. Basically, it's a, a particular kind of sausage, which has then become known as all the sausages. So okay. salted meat, right. salted sausages. So basically, at least from the sausage making we've done, that's actually a really key element that I didn't realize until mm -hmm. we started making sausages at home, which we did a little bit of last year and the year before. I didn't realize that adding salt to the meat in a certain very specific proportion, yeah. which actually produces a chemical reaction with the proteins, was really key to making sausages. I mean, I knew sausages had salt in them, but like, so does everything else. I didn't, but apparently it's actually... A really important part of what gives sausages their texture and yeah. and helps them be preserved and things like that. So that wouldn't have surprised me to learn about the ones that are dried and cured, but even, you know, Italian sausages that you just are about to barbecue or whatever. Right. So that was something I didn't know, but that makes sense. Indeed. And of course, the specific type of sausage salami also comes from that root. Right. Right. Of course. And by the by, salad. Mm -hmm. Yep basically means salted. It comes from the phrase herba salata, so salted vegetables. vegetables. Greens. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Which is a sort of late Latin medieval usage. Right. But it the the way that Romans presumably ate their vegetables as well, mm -hmm. salted and, and seasoned. Mm -hmm. And slaw as in coleslaw. Also from that, right. Also from that same root. Salted cabbage. Salted coleslaw. cabbage, yeah. So cool meaning cabbage related to kale, mm -hmm. so literally salted cabbage. Mm -hmm. And just as a sort of by the by, so I should say kind of at the outset that a lot of a lot of what I'm going to say today is based on a book by Dan Jurafsky, mm -hmm. which I highly recommend. It's an excellent book. A Linguist Reads the Menu, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. We'll put a link to it. But mm -hmm. um, one of the things he points out, interestingly, he, he sort of talks about various different, the history of, uh, of food and the words that, that are used to mm -hmm. describe them. And he points out 
when he's talking about sauce and salsa, in particular salsa verde, mm-hmm. um, that this is one of the few foods, a few recipes that makes its way from Europeans to the Muslim world. Oh, interesting. There's a lot of foods that come go in. Go the other way. Go the other way mm-hmm. that, um, you know, during the, the crusading years that get picked up by Europeans and brought back home to, to Europe. But this is one of the few foods that kind Actually of migrated the, the other, other way. way. And so I thought that was kind of an interesting. Salsa verde being herbs. Herbs, and vinegar and salt, right? Yeah. And basically, it's a sort of almost like a pesto, but with, like vine- a pesto. with, with yeah. vinegar instead of with oil. Yeah. So, the, you know, this sort of brings me to the Middle Ages. Mm-hmm. So the sauces in the Middle Ages were highly influenced by the notion of humorism. And so right. here's the, the where... The medical notion of humorism. The medical notion of humorism. This idea that people have these four humors in their body, these four fluids... This is, of course, I should say, entirely outmoded medical. Yes, yes, medical theory. theory. But, it, but it comes um, to them from the classical world. From the classical it's world, a, from yeah, Galen in long, particular. Yeah, it's and a long Stretching back to um, Hippocrates mm-hmm. in the Greek world. But there is this idea that the sauce that you pick has to be chosen from the standpoint of knowledge of the humors. Right. So, and so the sauces, there's a sort of quadrant view of how food, all food, right? Uh, yeah, all food all is food. either hot or cold or dry or, or moist, moist or yeah. and, and one of, or some combination of those. So you need to drink, you need to eat hot, moist food if you yeah. are particularly dry and cold yourself yeah. or whatever combination. And similarly, you have to complement the so if a particular meat is hot and dry, mm. you have to complement that with the right kind of with sauce. With a cool and s- moist sauce yeah. and or it, whatever. Yeah. yeah. And depending on the season, the t- time of year you right. use. In the, in the winter, you use hot, dry. To balance to out, balance the, out wintry. The, the wintry cold. So depending on the type of year and the person who's eating mm-hmm. and the type of food that the sauce is going with, you choose your sauce very carefully. Mm-hmm. So it's not about flavor compliment no it's, about it's more about medical. medical right yeah i think sometimes people now think they've invented or maybe a, i don't know to be fair a lot of people feel that they've rediscovered but the idea of thinking of all food as medicine yeah and i mean that's a very very prevalent ancient and medieval thought that all mm-hmm. food is medicine and then in fact most medicine is just food uh, i was reading something we'll get to a bit later but about how the thing about ancient medicine is it's very non-interventionist because basically they didn't have a lot of interventions they could do that would really help. Didn't have a lot of actual medications. Surgery was... A last resort. Really likely to kill you, basically. Not because they couldn't do surgery, but mostly because you'd just get an infection and die. And so they really didn't do surgery, except in a very few limited cases. And so they didn't really have a lot of interventions they could do. So diet was the major thing you could do other than, you know, basic binding of wounds and stuff like that, but for illnesses. So that's what medicine was, was food. And therefore food was medicine. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense of the sauces. And I will point out, this is a bit of a cheat, I suppose, but the word apothecary is from that same root. It's a very parallel kind of formation to condiment in a sense. Mm -hmm. But an apothecary was originally a storehouse. So it's the idea of to put away. Oh, right. Again, storage. From a Greek root, yeah. From a Greek root, from the Greek side. So it's a sort of parallel to the, the Latin condiment in a way. But of course, we can't talk about sauces and seasonings in the Middle Ages without bringing up the very widely repeated notion that spices and sauces were used to cover either tainted or salt-preserved meats. Mm-hmm. Tainted in the sense of gone bad. Gone bad, yeah. So off, you know. Mm-hmm. Stored too long, gone bad. Rotting meat. So this is, you know, one of these myths that is widely repeated. You will see it splashed over the internet and so forth. The reality is that there are lots of reasons for using spices. And a lot of it comes down to the sort of display of wealth notion. Mm -hmm. And of course, spices are so expensive that you wouldn't throw it away on poor ingredients. Right. The idea that you would have bad meat and then put spices that are almost literally worth their weight in gold onto the poor meat. If you could afford the spices, you could afford good meat. Mm -hmm. And if you couldn't and you had rotten meat, you also couldn't possibly afford the spices. Yeah. 
So there may well have been people who were eating bad meat, but they didn't get to disguise it. They just had to eat bad meat. (laughs) So myth quashed. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the reasons that comes up is because when you look at medieval recipes, they do tend to be the ones that we have very spice heavy, a lot more spicing and a lot stronger spicing than we would consider normal for such a dish. And so that was the Mm -hmm. idea that, oh, that's because they're trying to drown out the flavor. So the important thing, as you say, is the reason they're using so much spice is it's a conspicuous conspicuous consumption. Consumption, yeah. (laughs) Very literally. (laughs) Consuming it conspicuously. It's a way of showing off your wealth. Yeah. And what's important there is to remember that the recipes that we have that are written down from the Middle Ages until the late Middle Ages, really into the early modern period. Are feast recipes. Yeah. They don't write down how normal people Mm -hmm. ate, even how rich people ate on normal days. Because, and that's the same as we have for the ancient world. We do not have recipes for everyday Roman cooking. Mm -hmm. We only have recipes for the absolute gourmands and the gourmets and the show-off cookery. That's the only thing that was ever, that somebody, some man with the Mm -hmm. (laughs) the, uh, access to. Now, that's not quite true for the Middle Ages. There were women who would write things down. Mm -hmm. But still, basically, you're not going to spend expensive parchment and ink and scribal time. Writing down Basic. What peasants eat. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's just ludicrous. So you just wouldn't do it. So when we look at those recipes, we're looking at the equivalent of our Christmas feasts mm-hmm. and Thanksgiving meals or something mm-hmm. like that, not the equivalent of anything regular. Mm-hmm. The other thing is that, you know, most of those recipes don't make clear quantities. Right. So it's, it's all a bit of guesswork. It's all a bit of guesswork. Mm-hmm. People have sort of worked things out by looking at how much spices were purchased and mm-hmm. working Because we do have, for the, the Middle rate. Ages, not for the ancient world, but for the Middle Ages, you have inventory lists inventory and things lists like and that. Inventory lists and so yeah. forth, yeah. But in any case, from what we can tell, they were used sparingly, you know, given their expense. Mm -hmm. Now, let's turn to a few condiments in particular and Mm -hmm. consider uh, where they come from or where their their names come from. Mustard Mm -hmm. is a medieval, particularly popular medieval sauce, Mm -hmm. condiment, and it comes from must. So for anyone who knows anything about wine making. Oh, right, right. Must as in the unfermented juice mm. of the grapes. Right. Before you add the yeast, yeast it, yeah. or whatever to, to ferment it. And that was used in the preparation of the mustard seeds. Right. So you'd, you'd grind the mustard seeds and add grape juice. You'd add the grape juice, basically, mm-hmm. um, to make your prepared mustard. That's also referred to in the recipes we have often referred to as verjuice, right? Which is, verjuice is, is that green grapes, like unripe grapes, because it's particularly sour? Probably, though I that's so. that's one of the things that plays into this humorism. Oh, okay, um, right. So you would use vinegar in certain seasons or verjuice. So it depends oh, okay. what season you're okay. in. Depend, how acidic how you, you want to how be. How acidic you want it to be according to your medical requirements. right. Relish Mm -hmm. literally means release. In fact, release is a cognate with relish. Um, The idea is it's the flavor left behind that's released by the food. Hmm. And so initially it's used to refer to just flavors, taste. In the it appears in English uh, in the 1520s. Right, like so. So the idea of the relish, the that relish, you, you of your, relish something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Taste it. It doesn't come to be used to refer to a specific type of sauce, a mm-hmm. particular type of condiment, until the first occurrence is in 1797. That's quite late. So quite late, mm-hmm. yeah. But, of course, the most famous condiment of all, I suppose, is ketchup, mm-hmm. which essentially is originally a Chinese fish sauce. Right. But, of course, many cultures around the world have used fish sauce. This is not unique to China. Mm-hmm. And so there is a Western equivalent to this. Right. This is my segue. This is your segue. All right. So that brings us to the famous sauce of antiquity. There are, of course, other sauces, but the one that it's best known, in particular for the Roman world, is garum. Now, garum is Roman fish sauce. There's a couple other words I'll get to in a moment. Uh, It actually, it's most strongly associated with the Roman world, but in fact, the Greeks ate it too. Yeah. They ate it first. <laughs> and it's called garos, I think, in well, Greek. Well, the, yeah, the word garum seems to come from the Greek garos, which seems to refer to a type of fish. Ah, okay. So probably then referred to the sauce as well. The other words that are associated with garum are liquamen, 
mm-hmm. and alec. So basically what garum is, is it's, ma- it's a fermented fish sauce. Mm-hmm. You make it by layering fish and salt and sometimes herbs in a jar or a, a container. And you let it stand for a couple of months, usually in the sun, till it ferments, stirring it occasionally. And the liquid then, a, a certain amount of liquefaction occurs as it ferments. And the liquid that comes off the top is called garum or liquamen. And the residue, the sort of solid part, is alec. And all of those things are condiments, very, very basic condiments in Roman cuisine. Now, once it was made, you could take that garum or liquamen and you could add herbs to it. And in fact, we have, it, it seems to have been something where there was many different brands in the ancient world. So we know that they were making in Greece, but it's just one of many things that people sometimes ate. But once you get to the Roman world, it's everywhere. It's it's much more foundational to Roman cuisine than it is to Greek cuisine, which is why it's more strongly associated with the Romans. It's like the bottle of ketchup on yeah. the table of every American, uh, American mm-hmm. restaurant, restaurant or whatever. Yeah, yeah. diner. Diner, diner yeah. or whatever. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And we can tell this because of a number of reasons, but one of them is uh, there's lots of archaeological evidence of large factories, garum factories. Factories, of course doesn't mean quite the same thing it means now, but, you know, big places where this was made in bulk. And there are specific regions around, it's all over the Mediterranean, but in particular the shores of Spain and North Africa, there's a a large concentration of it in the Black Sea. Often it has to do with the fisheries that are nearby, but there are particular regions that were well known for it. And it was made in bulk in these factories, and then it was shipped around the Mediterranean, and there was a whole industry of people who would be garum sellers. Family, a lot of family monopolies, so in different regions, different Mm -hmm. sort of hereditary monopolies over the garum trade. And families or garum traders would get the stuff in bulk, and then they would add their own herbs or other flavorings to it. And so there'd be sort of house brands, house mixtures that were particular flavorings. Uh, You could add herbs. You could also add wine or vinegar or oil or water or honey and various other things to it. Hmm. And there were different words for that. So like oxyporum was one where you'd add honey and other spices to it. Hydrogarum is when you mix it with water. Oleogarum is when you mix it with oil. Oxygarum is when you mix it with vinegar. And oinogarum is when you mix it with wine. All of those are just garum with a word in front that means... Yeah, now I'm thinking of the etymologies of all those words. <laughs> well, oinos, of course. So, so the, a lot Wine, of those are yeah. interestingly Greek. Greek, yeah. yeah I was because these saying. are Greek words, right? Garas is a Greek mm-hmm. word. Oinos is Greek. Oxu is sharp in Greek. Right. Olia is... Oil right. in Greek. We've talked about that before. And hydro. Hydro. Hydro is, is, is water. Yeah. The oxyporum is uh, this vinegar and honey added. That's a different mixture. Right. Okay. It's a more complicated mixture. That one is very similar in a way to something like uh, Worcester sauce because it has a mixture of fish sauce and honey and herbs and, you know, a number of different flavorings in right. it that produce this sauce. So you'd get these garum vendors mixing it their house brand and selling it in small containers. And then some of the different places were known for different kinds. So New Carthage on the east coast of Spain was known for some of the best garum, the, the highest quality that was made from mackerel that was most expensive. And as I said, there were like family monopolies and equestrian families, like quite high up families who, who ran these trading businesses. We have amphorae. It was shipped around the Mediterranean. One of the things that was good about it was that it could be shipped in the same set of containers that wine was shipped in, these big pottery amphorae. Mm-hmm. And we have them with advertising on them. Like, oh. so they'll say they're garum, but they'll have phrase descriptive phrases like flower of garum or highest quality garum or, you know, so the right. sort of descriptive fla- and sometimes even kind of images that seem to be promoting right. a particular brand. So, so this it's, is our it's earliest early example of I don't know if it's our earliest. I don't know if it's our earliest. There may be others, but it is certainly a, an early example of sort of branding, branding. and advertising. I'm where have to people think about would, that if, if I can think of a, an earlier. I'd have to look. I don't know if the, mm. you know there were Egyptian examples or Mesopotamian right. examples. There may well be. You know, those are pretty mm-hmm. highly developed civilizations too. But one of the things that's going on here is because of the shipping across right. wide Right, you don't regions. know where it comes from. Mm-hmm. Well, and because it, it's a very widespread thing, but it does differ where it comes mm-hmm. from. It's not going to be the same. You know, at the same period, the Romans were also drinking wine that was very strongly branded. Right. Right. And, but, you know, wine was mm-hmm. sealed and it was labeled with its vineyards and its provenance and its, right. and its year and all of those things. So I... 
Garam, you know, was was part of that uh, that same sophisticated market. Let's put it sure. that way. Mm -hmm. By volume, Pliny says that Garam was about as expensive as perfume. That's a little hard to verify, and that some skepticism has been expressed by various classicists. I think what is true is it seems to have ranged. There was like really expensive garum and there was really cheap garum mm. and it depended where it came from and what kind it was and what it was made from and a bunch of things. There clearly was garum that was cheap enough for everybody to use. Lots and lots of containers that are marked as being garum and that you can do DNA testing and tell that it had fish residue in and stuff have been found all over the place. Everybody seems to have eaten it. Liquimen was the term used sometimes just generally for fish sauce, but also for in some of our sources for the higher, the sort of more refined, higher class fish sauce. So Apicius, who is our best source for Roman recipes, right. only ever talks about liquid men. He doesn't talk about garum. And it seems to be that, you know, he's only talking about the best quality mm. stuff. So he doesn't talk about garum. So there was like stuff that really fancy people could use, but there was also stuff that everybody was using. In that way, it's not quite the same as ketchup because there's no right. fancy ketchup. Except in the Bare Naked Ladies song. <laughs> <laughs> All the fanciest ketchups. Dijon custom ketchup. Yeah. ketchup. Um, and that's an If I Had a Million Dollars reference for those of you not up on your obscure Canadiana. So, you know, it, it does. So it's a little more maybe like mustard. Right. Right. Where there's basic yellow mustard that everybody has, but there's fancy mustard. So right. you could have that French chefs might use. We really are talking about a processed food. It was a byproduct in some ways of salting fish in general. The Romans right. ate lots of salted fish. It was not a high class food in general, but it was necessary. Before refrigeration, you cannot eat fish if you live more than a couple of miles from the sea. Right. Before refrigeration and, and fast transport, unless you salt it. Yeah. And salt fish was a big industry as well. And this is sort of a byproduct of it that develops into its own industry. Just to call back to what you were talking about with humors, and the other thing about garum is it does turn up as a medicine, just like any food really does. Uh, so Galen, who you already mentioned, prescribes it for a number of internal complaints and external. It gets used as a, in a poultice, suggested as something to treat burns. You should put garum on, which, given how salty it would be, sounds excruciating. But Imagine, it might actually... It, it might work as an antiseptic. That yeah. That element of it certainly might help. But Galen and other people prescribe it for a whole range of quite contradictory conditions mm. in a way that suggests that they don't really have any idea what it, you know, there are a couple of things it might have been helpful for, right. but the range of things it's prescribed for suggests that it's theoretical rather than a practical understanding of what it could really do. But it certainly was, did turn up as a medicine. I also saw one tantalizing reference in one work I was looking at to its use in cosmetics. Ooh. But I couldn't find anything more on that, and they didn't elaborate. Hmm. And it annoyed me because that nexus of food, medicine, and cosmetics is a really interesting nexus mm -hmm. that's really strongly overlapping in the ancient world and in the medieval world and mm -hmm. has been for a long time. So I would have liked to know what it was referring to, but I couldn't find any more details on that. So if anyone has any idea, but I cannot think offhand of what you would use garum for in a cosmetic sense, <laughs> except maybe as like a skin treatment or something right. like that, because they'll use anything. They, mm -hmm. they tried everything mm -hmm. as a skin treatment. So maybe for that. So that's what I have to say about Garum. One of the works I read, and I'll, I'll link this in the notes, was In Defense of Garum. It was an article. That was the title of the article from uh, 1983. And the reason for that is it's quite clear that for a long time for classicists, Garum stood as this bizarre thing that the Romans ate that was just beyond the pale as something <laughs> you could possibly imagine wanting to eat. And wasn't this one of their weird barbaric traits? And there are a few Roman references by contemporary Romans to the stinking putrid fish and to this awful stuff, which were then picked up on as being right. like, wasn't it a horrible thing? And it must have been just disgusting. But those very same Romans who say that also in other places talk about how wonderful it is and how noble it is. So, you know, it, it, it's used like anything else that sort of typifies a culture as both attack and praise, right. depending on if they want to attack somebody, they'll talk about it stinking fish. And if they want to praise somebody, they'll talk about them having the highest refined tastes. Right. So it was it was cherry picking. And then you get in the sort of 70s and 80s and 90s, a bunch of classes is saying, hey, 
but it's just like Nguoc Nam or, you know, t- Vietnamese and Thai fish sauce as as Western European and North American cuisines were being opened up to these other cuisines. Suddenly you have a bunch of classicists are like, wait a minute, it's not so bad. Actually, it's really quite tasty. And wait, it's just like Worcester sauce and <laughs> things like that. So you see this development in their own cultural prejudices right. that's mapped onto the ancient world. And there's mm. this real shift in the way that it's it's talked about by the scholars that reflects their own, the changes in Western cuisine, not anything to do with the Romans. I just thought I'd bring that up because it amused me to see, <laughs> to see that trajectory of, you know, this very British centric, right. you know, insular, literally viewpoint. And you can see that changing as you look mm-hmm. at the different articles about Garam. So by now you may be wondering, well, how do we get from these various ancient traditions of fermented fish <laughs> to tomato ketchup that we have on our hot dogs and hamburgers? Mm-hmm. And so there's a long and twisty history here. The word ketchup comes, and presumably the sauce itself, comes from China. So there isn't, there does not seem to be a continuous tradition of fish sauce in Europe from the ancient world to... Mm -hmm. It seems to have mostly disappeared. disappeared. So there's a couple of, there's one Italian region, I think maybe Sardinia, (laughs) ironically perhaps, (laughs) (laughs) but maybe not. And there's at least one region of Italy which continues a, a fish sauce tradition. So that, but you know how regional Italian right. food is. Right. It, it can be very different from place to place. So there's been, I think there were a couple of holdovers, but they didn't make it into more mainstream. Right. And I mean, anchovy sauce and right. anchovies yes. obviously do sure. hold on and mm-hmm. salted anchovies. So there was a particular cuisine in Southeast Asia, parts of Southeast Asia that eventually became settled by the Chinese, but at the time, these were the people more closely associated with the Vietnamese and the Thai and and so forth Mm -hmm. that were invaded or moved into by the Chinese. They sort of inherited the food traditions of that region when Mm -hmm. they did, Mm -hmm. but they had this tradition of preserving fish. Again, it was this kind of layering idea. Mm -hmm. You layer fish with salt Mm -hmm. and cooked rice and bamboo leaves. Oh, okay. Which then would lead to fermentation again. Would lead to fermentation, and that would be your your fish sauce. Mm -hmm. But the word ketchup is itself Chinese. So so the word chop in in Chinese, specifically in Hokkien Chinese, in the sort of coastal Fujian region, the particular language spoken in the the coastal region in southern China, means sauce. Right, okay. And ke means preserved fish. So literally it means sort of preserved fish sauce or brine fish brine sauce or something like that right eventually the word ketchup it gets picked up in a number of other asian cultures asian languages borrow the word ketchup and Mm -hmm. it comes to refer to to just mean sauce so in some languages it it, it just means soy sauce or sweetened soy sauce so for instance in indonesian the famous ketchup manis oh yeah yeah which we've We've used. We've used. Yeah. It refers to a kind of sweet soy sauce, mm-hmm. so not a fish sauce. Mm-hmm. So it becomes it becomes what we call semantic bleaching. It just becomes it refers to sauce generally, right? But of course, this is you know around when Europeans were trading with China, in particular, the sailors seem to have picked up the sauce to liven up their rather bland and horrible <laughs> ships, ships rations. rations. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Which would no doubt involve ships, biscuits, and biscuits, dried beef, yeah, yeah. and salt cod and salt, things like that, yeah, fish and so forth. And so, uh, having something tasty to <laughs> put on it uh, mm-hmm. could be a, a boon. And so, it, it seems to be these uh, sailors who were in the East India Company, they brought it back to Europe in around the sort of late seventeenth early 18th century mm-hmm. and that's when it makes its way to to Europe and it becomes a very profitable trade item for the East India Company still in its fish sauce still in its original so they're they're just bringing back bottled right. fish sauce from from, from China East, yeah. yeah and eventually what happens of course as with many things is the Europeans try to replicate this mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. so as not to spend the Massive money, amounts yeah. of money that is required to yeah, ship it back. It, right. And this is a little bit like in the video that we did on Japaning, right? Right. Yes. The, yeah. the Japanese lacquer work. So they mm-hmm. tried to. They liked it, but they liked it, it was but they expensive. And so they tried to make knockoff recipe, version. a yeah. knockoff version of it. 
And so they used all kinds of other ingredients. Mushrooms were particularly important in some of the early European ketchups. Which makes perfect sense because it's got that kind of meaty flavor to it. Yeah, And walnuts. Mm -hmm. Apparently it was Jane Austen. Talks about walnut sauce. Walnut. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, walnut ketchup so Mm -hmm. and eventually tomatoes because of course they wouldn't they weren't really a prevalent item until no because tomatoes of course are a new world Mm -hmm. product so this is a sort of testament to the kind of global trade that's going on here i mean we get a sauce that originally comes from asia Mm -hmm. to europe and then gets recreated using american new world new world ingredients and so it's this sort of kind of Mm -hmm. fusion of of different cultures coming together fusion cuisine fusion cuisine the original fusion cuisine if you will now since we're on the topic of the u.s the americas in the american colonies and later the united states the spelling catsup c-a-t-s-u-p was initially the um, the preferred american spelling whereas ketchup with a k was the sort of more common British spelling Mm -hmm. until the Heinz company, the Heinz brand ketchup in the U.S., they started spelling it with the K spelling as a way of differentiating themselves in the U.S. market. You know, right? They they all make catsup, but we make ketchup, right? Sort of thing. And then because they sort of stole the market and became the brand, Mm -hmm. um, all the other producers sort of followed suit and. Started using that spelling, so now catsup is a sort of minor it's regional, spelling. right? It, there's still regions where there's they say regions, catsup. I yeah. think, yeah, but it's now no longer the the sort of preferred Standard American spelling. spelling. Yeah. But all of this, in any case, as I say, highlights the kind of globalism of this food trade. Mm -hmm. And as a result of of this production of ketchup from China originally, before they were trying to reproduce it, China became kind of an economic superpower. Not just because of ketchup, I should say, but because of a number of other manufactured products. So they were, in terms of manufacturing, they were, you know, hundreds of years ahead of Europe Mm -hmm. until the Industrial Revolution. Right. So ketchup was one of these manufactured products that China was exporting. That Europe didn't have an equivalent for. That Europe didn't have and were desperate to get. Mm -hmm. Others, of course, include China Mm -hmm. and silk. Mm -hmm. China, I should say, porcelain. Yeah make that clear Uh, porcelain silk and so forth all these manufactured products Mm -hmm. that they were uh, shipping out so they became this kind of economic powerhouse because Mm -hmm. all this money was flowing into china for all these manufactured products flowing out and it's been argued that this is one of the things that led to european global expansion particularly in the americas is this the need to get something to something to to fix the trade imbalance in particular they needed silver right. to pay for all these trade goods that they were getting from China. Because they really didn't have much that the Chinese wanted. Wanted, no. This is they, the thing. Th- I mean, what could they export to them that the China didn't already have? They had resources yeah. already mm-hmm. in general, and then they had the production. What did Europe have that China needed other than guns, basically? Mm-hmm. And once they sort of figured out how to make those, they could make them themselves. They didn't need to import them. But silver is silver. a scarce commodity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the, the South American silver that the Spanish... Mm-hmm. Was so important for that reason. Was so yeah. important And for just that went reason. straight, a lot of it, straight to China. Straight to China to get those manufactured, manufactured goods. goods. Mm-hmm. And so it has been argued that European expansionism is a direct result of this desire for... So basically the fact Asian that China was so advanced products. in its technology is the cause of the global empires. It's yes. all China's fault? <laughs> That seems fairly unfair. I, as a I don't way think to that's entirely <laughs> fair to put it that way, but uh... especially given how China then got treated later on. But yeah. I mean, that that also is part of the reason why England wanted to hook them on opium, right? Right. Because they desperately needed something to sell to the Chinese. To the Chinese, yeah. To make up for the amount that they were buying from them, and so they were like, "Hey, there's here's this thing we have that you're going to really want if we can get you hooked on it." Yeah. And so that is a direct result, really, of that as well. Yeah. And so, you know, in terms of this kind of and this is something that that we will be discussing in a future video. But (laughs) there is this kind of Colombian exchange that goes on Mm -hmm. um, as a result of Europeans going to to the Americas. They pick up not only the silver, but also New World plants, Mm -hmm. foodstuffs. 
Mm -hmm. like the potato or the sweet potato in particular, particular right. goes to China and becomes an important food source in China. Right. So generally we can say that ketchup is this kind of really emblematic product. Mm -hmm. It's emblematic of particular historical circumstances. His historical yeah. circumstances. So the, the need for preservation, mm -hmm. um, the processed foods mm -hmm. and the global food economy, right. the global food trade, as foods get uh, shipped around the world and exchanged from one region to another. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing you haven't addressed, but maybe is a whole other topic in itself, why does it become so so quintessentially American? You know, it's not that ketchup isn't known elsewhere, but it becomes, mm -hmm. the, but it becomes American the American thing. sauce. Yeah. As opposed to, for instance, in Britain, you end up with other versions, presumably basically Worcester sauce mm -hmm. and or Worcester sauce or however we're going to pronounce that, <laughs> and HP sauce yep. are also essentially versions of ketchup. Yeah. You know, other other attempts to replicate this kind of a condiment, though they also have their medieval resonances, uh, especially HP sauce because of its strong uh, cloves and yes. and those sweet spices that are, are very much a holdover of medieval traditions. Uh, so but it would be, you know, why why did why Britain did go it? that direction yeah. and the Americas end up because Canada too, Canada yeah. absolutely mm. eats ketchup for sure. Mm -hmm. And we also have HP sauce here, mm -hmm. but ketchup is definitely more prominent. No, yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, why why that split? I don't have an answer to that, and and I think I do think that's a whole another story. Yeah, probably more of a twentieth century story. story yeah. I would suspect nineteenth twentieth century story. I think one of, one of the things that they that they found is sort of adding more sugar and vinegar mm -hmm. and to make it this sort of sweet and sour kind mm -hmm. of flavor mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. um, beyond the fish sauce, yeah. So beyond the fish sauce. Yeah, so instead of being sort of a meaty, because what the fish sauce, the fermentation process does is it brings out what we would now call an umami flavor. It brings yeah. out that that meaty flavor of the fish. It reduces the fishiness of it quite a lot, yeah. but it reduces, but it produces this meatiness. So it transforms from a meaty and salty to a salty still, mm -hmm. but sweet and sour. Sweet and sour sauce, sauce in both yeah. in HP sauce and in, in ketchup. Ketchup, not yeah. in Worcester sauce so much, yeah. but but then Worcester sauce is not used the same way ketchup and, and HP sauce are. Yeah. yeah, no, I think there's probably a whole second, <laughs> third, fourth. I'm not saying we'll do this anytime soon if we do at all, but an episode to be done yeah. on the sort of 20, 19th and 20th century history of of these sauces and condiments because I think they yeah. there's a whole story there to yeah. do with factory production and mm -hmm. commercialization and branding and you know the Heinz story yeah. is probably a large part of the story of ketchup in yeah. the U.S. In the U.S., instance, yeah. yeah. And of course, there's a whole other story about spice trade and... Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Which and we've touched on before touched and, on and a bit before, it but... is its own. As we said with the East India Company last time, that could be its own podcast, mm -hmm. like series, yeah, <laughs> the yeah. spice trade. Spice trade. <laughs> it's a very complex story. But even in, in specifically the, the kind of Roman world and mm -hmm. their particular spices that... Uh, yeah, and that they were you know, using and, and transporting and that became the luxury mm -hmm. items. Yeah, for sure. But maybe let's stop now. Stop I think it. we've talked enough about <laughs> sauce <laughs> for one night. And we didn't even get into all the puns. <laughs> we clearly weren't sauced enough. <laughs> so let's call an end to it, to the condiments for the night. Mm -hmm. But I would be interested in hearing if there's anybody who'd like to let us know of particular things we didn't cover that you think might be an interesting topic. Or as Mark asked at the beginning, if you know about Caesars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And how you pronounce Worcester sauce, Worcestershire sauce. Worcestershire sauce. That's that's what I'm going with and I'm st <laughs> sticking, sticking with to it. it. Yeah. So let us know uh, whether you're a brown sauce or a ketchup person. So yeah, let us know what your saucy thoughts are. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll return soon with possibly more food related thoughts. Yeah, we'll see. In the next little while. Good night. Good night. For more information on this podcast, check out the website www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com alliterative. 
Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is on Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at Alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. And please review it on iTunes if you can and if you've enjoyed it. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.